When was the last time you were disappointed? (laughs) Yesterday? This morning? Right? You walk in and you expect things to just go smoothly every Sunday morning, and then something like uh, you get a printer malfunction. It's disappointing. Disappointment comes in all shapes and sizes, doesn't it? It can range from the minor letdowns like printer malfunctions or like I drove to Chick-fil-A for lunch only to then realize it was Sunday. Or to the extreme and traumatic on the other end, like uh, the moral failure of a spouse or abuse from someone you trusted. Those things that we would we would barely even want to classify as disappointment because of the the pain that they bring with them. This kind of disappointment leaves a mark, doesn't it? And it can have lasting ramifications on your ability to trust other people or even your ability to truly love someone because you fear that if you love that way again, you're only going to get hurt again. And it's just easier to keep yourself closed off. The disciples of the Lord Jesus experienced disappointment, didn't they? The passage we read this morning, the the scripture reading that Josh read for us, Jesus is telling them, I'm going away, and what did he say? Your hearts are sad because I'm going away. And then he goes and dies. Well, that was disappointing. That, That was not what they expected. Exodus chapter 6 records for us, I think, one of the most traumatic and widespread disappointments recorded in all of Scripture. If you remember back to last week, uh, we saw Moses and Aaron arrive in Egypt. And they met with the elders of Israel and they told them that God had seen and heard and known and He was going to come and rescue them. And then they showed off their miracles, right? Like the stick into the snake thing and the, the hand inside the cloak. And like, it's leprous. It's not. It's leprous. It's not. And the people believed. And they worshipped. And it seems like at that point, all systems are go for immediate exodus out of Egypt. We are ready to launch. Let's get out of here. But not so fast. The Lord had other plans for Israel and for Egypt and for Moses. Oftentimes for us. And those plans included for them news that would bring great disappointment to all of Israel, including Moses. But here's the thing I want us to understand. The Lord is God over your disappointments. He rules over disappointment. What I mean by that is that disappointments do not happen by accident. They are not mistakes in God's plans. They're not even caused by other people. It's not as if God uh, looked away for a moment and someone got away with something and it really hurt you. And it's, and it's not as if it's just someone who's out to really mess up your life or make life difficult. And, and that's the root cause of my disappointment. Folks, those disappointments are under the rule of Almighty God. They are part of His plan for His people. That's not a popular message in modern Christianity. Right? What what does modern Christianity want you to believe? Modern Christianity wants you to believe, in in, in many corners of Christianity I should say, uh, what what they want you to believe is that if you uh, you are really good and and you're really sincere and you're following the Lord, that everything's going to be great. Like you're going to be 
dancing in the rain and, you know, everything's coming up roses. But that's not how God works, oftentimes with his people. Look at Exodus chapter 6. Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter, so, so hang with me here. If you've got a Bible, it's going to be fantastic for you to follow along. I think you'll find it really helpful. Uh, verse number 1 says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. The taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work. Your daily task each day is when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met with Aaron, or with Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. Man, what a massive disappointment. To go from the high of God is seen and he has come because he has heard of our trouble and he is going to free us. And, and we got these two guys, Moses and Aaron, and they can do miracles and nothing's going to stop us now, right? And then all of a sudden, not only do they not get to leave, but things are made worse. How do we respond in those times of trouble? Let's look first. I want us kind of three parts to this sermon. Number one, I want us to look at where disappointment comes from. And then we're going to look at some things and some responses that we have that tend to make disappointment worse. And then we're going to consider a few ways at the end of, of things that we can do that will actually help us through the times of disappointment. But first of all, where does disappointment come from? Well, it comes oftentimes from unmet expectations, doesn't it? Unmet expectations. Someone on the way into the, the to church this morning said, we're expecting great things. And my response was, uh-oh. <laughs> I like to keep the expectations low. It's kind of my joking response. That way there's nowhere to go but up. But the problem is when I have expectations and then someone falls short of those expectations, now I experience disappointment, don't I? This is what happens on a massive scale to Israel. There is expectation that we are marching out of Egypt. We're going to the promised land. God has promised and here we go. And then all of a sudden the expectation is not met. 
It doesn't come to pass. Some people believe that after Moses and Aaron met with the people of Israel, they just, they kind of quit working. And, and they think this because when you look at verses 4 and 5, it, it sounds like Pharaoh is saying, they've already stopped working. And it's your fault, Moses and Aaron. They're not producing, and it's because you filled their head with this nonsense. It's almost like they were having a big watch party. Like, let's, man, Moses is going to Pharaoh. Let's just sit back and see how this thing's going to turn out. Maybe they were having a prayer meeting. Lord, give Moses favor in Pharaoh's eyes. In some ways, they were already checked out. Like, they were already there. They were already in the land of promise. They were gone. You know how this works, right? When vacation's coming? Like, the last couple days of work, it's like punching the time clock. But I'm already on vacation in my mind. But what happens when you're ready? you got bags packed. You're ready to go. You've already checked out of work. And all of a sudden, the trip gets canceled. I don't know, because of something like worldwide pandemic of some virus, right? Or something happens at work and your boss is like, I, you, you just can't. Like, I cannot let you go right now. And all of a sudden, all of those expectations come crashing down around you. Talk about disappointment. But this is a little worse than that. Because not only is it disappointment of I can't go, but it's like now I can't go. But, but on top of that, your boss increases your workload. And then your water heater floods your house. And then you get a flat t- and then you get the virus on top of all of it, and none of that matters to your boss who just wants you to get the job done. But for Israel, it gets even worse because not only do they, uh, th- does the boss still want them to get the job done, but they get beaten if they don't, and he's taken away some of the means of actually accomplishing the job. And this is the second uh, place that disappointment comes from it comes from unmet expectations which we all experience on a regular basis in our relationships with one another in our circumstances in life but number two it comes from increased hardship especially when you pair the two together you have an expectation israel's expectation was we are leaving we are out of here freedom right not only do they not get to leave, but now their hardship increases. It's unfair. In some ways, it's one thing to know ahead of time that things are going to get more difficult, life is about to get more challenging, but it's a little bit different when you expect that things are about to get better, but then they turn for the worse. This is what happens to Israel. They expected deliverance and they got a punch to the gut. Like, we're not even giving you straw and we're not reducing the tally of bricks that you have to produce at all. It's like Pharaoh was stewing over Moses and Aaron's audacity. They want me to let all of this free labor just walk away? (laughs) I'll show them. They're not going to walk away. I'm going to crush them. He became so indignant over the request that he decided to ask to do something. And what he decides to do is to make life miserable, make life in some sense a living hell for Israel. And we're not terribly familiar with the process of making bricks today. I don't think that's something most of us have been engaged in. So, so just so we understand a little bit of, of what's going on, we know the process of making bricks. It, it's pretty well documented. There's actually even a tomb in the, the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt where uh, there are pictures painted on the wall, of the process of brick making. And that process is it's fairly simple, but, but you have a certain group of people that their responsibility was to draw water that would then be mixed with mud and straw. That mud and straw mixture would then be packed by another group of people into uh, wooden frames and then set out in the sun to bake and to dry. And then after they dried, another group would come along and would stack those bricks uh, that have been dried and hardened in the sun and then haul them off to wherever the construction site is. But straw was pretty essential to the process. Straw was to the brick, kind of like rebar is to our concrete. 
It produced a bit of added rigidity, a little bit extra strength for the bricks. So if you take away straw, all of a sudden the likelihood that these bricks you are making are going to fail in the process. When you crack open that frame or pop it out, they're going to break. So now all of a sudden it's more difficult to make the brick because you're losing more bricks along the way. You're less efficient at making them, and they're less structurally sound. They just don't work as well. Straw was included in the brick. As a matter of fact, it's so common uh, back in the late 1800s, there was an archaeologist, they were doing a dig in a place called uh, Tel El Mashkuta, okay? Now, a tell, in case you don't know, a tell is kind of like a, a big mound of dirt. It kind of looks like a hill. But that big mound of dirt, like under the soil, would be like an ancient city or buildings, and over the centuries, the soil or the sand is just built up until it's completely covered. And so archaeologists see these tells, and they go, you know what, we think that might be a tell, and they go and start digging around to see if they can find something. Well, at this particular tell, uh, when they uncovered what was below, the archaeologist, this is what he said, he said, I carefully examined around the chamber walls and noticed that some of the corners of the brickwork throughout were built of bricks without straw. And this is what he said, I do not remember to have met anywhere in Egypt bricks so made. In other words, bricks always had straw. Except there's one place. Now, what is also interesting about this, for you archaeologists among us, um, El Mascuta is believed by many people to, bu- to be uh, the ancient uh, city of Python. You say, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, we're told that the Israelites built storehouses for Pharaoh in Python. So could it be that these, these buildings that were built bricks with no straw are actually some of the bricks that the Israelites made during the time when Pharaoh took away their ability to get the straw. We don't know for sure. But whether that's the case or not, what is certain is that Israel's job just became undoable. There was no way they were going to keep up with the workload because now they had to go out and find straw. Straw was no longer going to come to the work site in these big bundles that they could break open and apply to the brick. In fact, it says they couldn't find straw at all. It it seems as if what Pharaoh, what the edict, uh, how it was at least interpreted by the people was, you're not even going to give straw to Israel. Because it says they had to go and and use stubble in place of straw. And stubble was what was left of the grain. When when the, the harvesters would come by and they would put their sickle or the siths in and they would chop it down, the stubble was what was left. Right? Think like five o'clock shadow, right? The guy gets a little bit of stubble. Some of it's more than others, right? What is that? The stubble is what's left after you cut off what was there, what's left between the blade and the skin. It's stubble, which means that in order to gather what they needed, they were likely going out to fields that had already been harvested. Now they have to pull the, the stubble from the ground, or they got to dig through the soil that had been turned up to find these much shorter stalks and bring it back to try to use stubble in place of straw. It was an impossibility. They couldn't keep up. Things had gotten much worse. And then when they failed to produce the required number of bricks, the foremen, who were Israelites, set over the people to keep the people organized and on task. Those foremen were beaten. Well, that's just not even fair, is it? You take away my ability to do the job and then you beat me for not getting it done? That's insanity. That would be their argument to Pharaoh, verse number 15. Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say make bricks. And then we get beaten for it. But it's your people's fault because they won't give us any straw. What do you want us to do? Folks, this is where disappointment comes from. It comes from unmet expectation and increased hardship. That there are some things that we can do that I think tend to make it worse. And, and we see that littered all over in this story. The way that Israel and Moses responds in the story doesn't help them handle the disappointment. In fact, it makes it worse. So what are some ways that we should not respond? Number one, it gets worse when we fear gets worse when we fear. 
Pharaoh's question to Moses and Aaron was, who is Yahweh? I don't know him. Now Moses and Aaron try to answer the question. He's the God of the Hebrews. Why should you obey him? Because he met with us, and if you don't let us go, he's going to send plagues and the sword. Like, we're all in trouble if you don't obey, right? That's why you should listen to Yahweh. But this doesn't faze Pharaoh. He sends out his edict about the straw. But I want you to see this contrast. Look at verse number one. Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh with this message. Thus says the Lord. Now, that's the first time in all of Scripture that that, kind, that phraseology is used, but it's not going to be the last time, is it? It's going to become a well-known phrase that's used by the prophets who come to Israel to deliver the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord. They're going to say it over and over and over again. And then uh, by the time we get to Jesus, Jesus is not going to say, thus says the Lord. He's going to say, I say to you. Just an interesting uh, distinction where Jesus is displaying his God-like authority through the declaration of his word. So Moses and Aaron come to Pharaoh and they say, thus says the Lord, but look at verse number 10. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, who is this Yahweh? He has something to say to me? Well, I have something to say to him. And now the gauntlet's been thrown out. Whose word will you listen to? Whose words will have most effect in you? Is it the word of the Lord? Is it thus saith Yahweh? Or is it thus saith Pharaoh? Which will have the lasting impact? The intention of Pharaoh's message was clearly to strike fear in the hearts of the Israelites. It's meant to break their spirit and crush any hope that they may have had of freedom. And it worked. We know this because if you just kind of flip over maybe a page to Exodus chapter 9, or chapter 6, verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. God meets again with Moses and says, this is the message you give to Israel. And so Moses takes the message back to the people of Israel, but this is what happens. But they did not listen to Moses. Why? Because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. All of a sudden, the word of Pharaoh had much more impact than the word of the Lord. Folks, fear makes disappointment worse. Disappointment has a way of fixing our attention on the things that are outside of our control. And that causes us to fear. And fear tells us that the situation is hopeless. That things are never going to get better. And that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Israel, in the midst of severe disappointment, are now focused on Pharaoh, who they cannot control. And they feel the situation is hopeless. Things for them do not seem to have any hope of getting better. Those are the ones we fear though, right? The ones that we believe have some control over us. Especially if you have trust issues with that person. Fear pushes us down. Robs us of hope. And it tells us to get used to disappointment. Fear makes disappointment worse. The temptation in disappointment is to take your eyes off of thus saith the Lord. And put them onto what everybody else has to say. Second thing that makes disappointment worse is that we can tend to turn to our slave masters for help. Now that sounds outrageous, right? But that's exactly what the people of Israel did. It's exactly what the foreman did. They go to Pharaoh for help. Now, you can say, well, what's the big deal? They're Pharaoh's slaves, right? Right? And in one sense, you would be right to ask the question because there's nothing wrong with making an appeal to our authorities. There's nothing wrong with trying to reason with them and even using the laws of the land to our advantage. That's not wrong. But I want you to listen to their words to Pharaoh again. And I want you to listen for one word that gets repeated over and over and over again. Verse number 15, this is what they say. Why do you treat your servants like this? 
No straw is given to your servants. Yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. What's the word that gets repeated over and over and over again? Servants, right? Now, why is that a big deal? Well, you remember what God told Moses to say to Pharaoh back in Exodus chapter 4? Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, he says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, there's a thus saith the Lord again, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. That's what he was supposed to be. Israel was to be set free from their bondage. This is what God does. He frees slaves and makes them sons, and sons serve their father. This is not just a matter of the Israelite foreman going to Pharaoh and saying, hey, we're having a hard time, and and, and this is not really right, we need your help. This is a matter of them coming to Pharaoh and saying, we still serve you, Pharaoh. Given the option between this God who has not set us free and you who is currently making our life miserable, we will choose you if it means that you will relieve us of some of our burdens. That is not how God had called Israel. He had called them to go into the wilderness, to be his sons. He had called them to freedom. He had called them to worship. He had called them to rest. But Pharaoh was calling them to work. Listen, rest is not inactivity in God's program. Rest is worship. Rest is fellowship with God. Because it is in that fellowship and in that worship that we find our place. That work no longer feels like work, but satisfaction to our soul. And that's why Jesus says, come to me, all you who are overworked and overburdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. That's why we still gather on Sunday mornings for a worship service, right? We serve the Lord in our worship. And that's why we try to emphasize the fact that worship is not just an entertainment thing or it's not even just a battery recharge. Worship is work. We respond to God's call. But in that work, we find rest. Israel would rather continue to serve Pharaoh and, and listen, that sounds outrageous, right? It sounds crazy. But remember, this story is not just a historical fact. It's interesting for us to read. We said at the beginning, this is God revealing spiritual truths to us with the main truth being this. God saves slaves and makes them sons. And the reality is we are all slaves to sin. That's how we begin. Romans chapter 6, we know that our old self is crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved by sin. Or John 8, 34, Jesus himself says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That is the reality of our condition apart from freedom in Christ. And the astounding thing is that, that if you pay attention to people, like you just watch the people around you. Because what they tend to do is, is like, like hard times happen, bad things happen, and, and, and in order to find relief from that disappointment, they turn back to the very things that sourced that disappointment in the first place. It's like, you know, it's like the dog returning to its vomit. That, that's you know, the gross imagery that Proverbs gives us. But it offers an explanation for addictions that we have, doesn't it? Like it doesn't matter what kind of damage those addictions do. There's something in us that, that turns back to those slave masters in order to find relief from our slavery. What about you? What about us? To what do you return? To where do you go for comfort and relief from your disappointment? Is it the same old sexual sins? Pornography? The same old laziness? 
The same old relationships? Maybe it's work. Maybe you've been trying all your life to define yourself by your career and by what you do. And now through a season of disappointment with work, because maybe you got fired, you've been overlooked for promotion, or you're dissatisfied with what you're doing, you double down on the amount of time you spend at work or the effort that you give at work. You're disappointed and discouraged because your identity has been disrupted Yet instead of turning to the Lord, we turn right back to the thing that couldn't satisfy in the first place. Maybe it's entertainment. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's food. You keep turning back to that to give you comfort and your health continues to decline. And it would keep coming back. Folks, the reality is if your answer is not the Lord is where I turn in my disappointment, then you are likely returning to a slave master expecting to find him merciful. But what you will find is not mercy, but increased demands with less satisfaction. That's how the gods of this world operate. They will increase their demands and they will give you less in return. Is what happens to the foreman. Pharaoh said to them, you're idle. You are idle. That's why you say, let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. Now, go and do your work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. He doesn't care about the burdens. He demands more. He calls them lazy. You see what the gods of this world do? When you come to them for relief, they will bury you under guilt. They will bury you under shame. They will bury you under workload. Which is why Jesus says, hey, are you overworked? Are you exhausted by these gods? Come find out how I'm different. I will set you free. The third response that we have that makes things more difficult through disappointment is that we tend to take it out on someone else you look at verse number 20 these foremen as they leave their meeting with pharaoh they met moses and aaron moses and aaron were waiting for them and as they come out from pharaoh these foremen turn to moses and aaron and they say the lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of pharaoh and his servants you've put a sword in their hand to kill us I mean, they just ambushed Moses and Aaron, didn't they? John Calvin, in his commentary on Exodus, he says this about this encounter. He says, that blind grief is here described which with a fury akin to madness aroused the Israelites to unfounded anger against the innocent who had deserved nothing of the kind. This outbreak, he says, arose from lack of faith because they measured the favor of God by their immediate success. Well, that's insightful all by itself, isn't it? They measured the favor of God by their immediate success. In other words, when, when immediately the thing that they were praying for and hoping for didn't happen, they figured God's favor, there was, there was something wrong, something's not right. God certainly would not have wanted this. God certainly wouldn't have ordained this. I don't know, maybe you've been on the receiving end of this kind of an ambush. Like you reach out and you try to help somebody. You try to do the right thing. And things don't go immediately well for them. And what do they do? They turn back on you. They attack you. Maybe that's something you've done to someone else. Maybe someone reached out to you and things didn't turn out. And you came after them. You blew up at them. And we try to understand this. We, out of love, I think we tell ourselves that's just, you know, that's what people do when they're hurting, right? It's, it's, like, the, it's like the injured animal. You've you got to be careful because they're likely to lash out at the people who are trying to save them. But listen, you are not animals. There is a sinful reality to this problem. And I'm not saying we shouldn't give people the benefit of the doubt. We shouldn't try to love them through their hurt and their pain. We should. 
But the reality is when we turn and blame other people who are trying to help, we blame the innocent, we are revealing something in ourselves that is rather sinful, and that is that our knowledge of God is far too thin. The foreman looked around at their circumstances, and they decided there was no way that God would have allowed this to happen. And so that's why they said to Moses and Aaron, the Lord judge you. You did this to me. You made things worse. The Lord judge you. What are they saying? God would have never done this. You guys really messed up. But it was God, wasn't it? It was God who allowed it. It was God who not only allowed it, but ordained it. God already said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Folks, our faith must not be in a God who is too thin to control our disappointments because that is not the God who has revealed himself in the scripture. The God of the Bible is the God who sovereignly ordains our disappointing circumstances. This is really the problem, I think, that underlies all the other issues that we've mentioned. It's a lack of faith, or, or at least a lack of faith in the true God, the way God has actually revealed himself in the scripture. This leads us to yet another way that we make this appointment worse, and this is the last one before we close, and that is that we tend to forget. We tend to forget. Look at verse number 22. Moses turned to Yahweh and said, Oh Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Folks, Moses forgot. God told him two times. Right, Exodus chapter 3, 19, I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Exodus 4, 21, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. And now Moses is standing before God saying, see, I told you so, why did we ever do this? Pharaoh responded earlier with, who is Yahweh? And that's really the issue here, isn't it? Pharaoh issues a direct challenge to Yahweh, of course, but it's also a challenge to Moses and Aaron and all of Israel. Who is this God of yours to think that he can deliver you from me? What if I make your life a living hell? Will you still believe that he can deliver you? And under the pressure of an impossible workload and extreme fatigue and unfair treatment and what looked like unfulfilled promises, all of that severe disappointment, they forgot not only what God had said, but who it was that had said it to them. He is the great I am. Who can stop him from fulfilling his promises? Folks, all of this this kind of forgetfulness lead us to despair, to lose hope entirely. Israel was there. The foremen were there. Moses was there. I think he was hoping that the Lord might recognize his mistake and just allow Moses to return to his own exile in Midian because life was easier there. He could just take care of his family, watch his father's, father-in-law's sheep, and, and, and much like Israel would eventually do, by the way, when they get out in the wilderness and they're met with disappointment, like, hey, where's the food and the water and all this good stuff? Let's just go back to Egypt. Moses is like, you know what, this is too hard. I told you it was a bad idea. Let's just go back to Midian. In Midian, he didn't have the burden of ministry leadership. There, he didn't face the failures of his own past or be forced to face the rejection of his own people again, and he just wants out. This is the temptation for us, isn't it? Trials come, disappointments come, and suddenly we forget the promises of God. We forget the God who has made the promises. We even forget the ways in which he has shown up in our lives in the past and delivered on those promises in remarkable and astounding ways. Folks, what will we do when adversity hits us, not only as individuals or families, but what will we, we do when adversity hits us as a church? When we find ourselves in the midst of hardship and disappointment, I'll tell you, it's going to be easy in those moments to forget all the ways that God has shown himself faithful to us in the past. The extraordinary ways he has blessed us and preserved us and provided for us. And it would be easy in those moments to fear and to point fingers at each other and even to turn to other saviors rather than turning to the Lord. 
The temptation in our disappointments is to forget who God really is. That He is God over our disappointments. So let's talk about three things that will help. What helps? Number one, these are going to be fairly obvious, okay? Number one, turn to the Lord. Now listen, we give Moses some grief here because he seems to completely give up, but I will give him credit for this. He does not turn to Pharaoh for help. He turns to the right person. Like, I don't understand it. I don't like it. I want out. I tried to tell you. But he at least turned to the right person rather than back to his slave masters. He didn't look to Pharaoh for deliverance. He didn't even look to himself. Let's go kill some Egyptians. He turned to the one who had promised deliverance. And that is always the right answer. His faith was shaken, but the impulse of that faith still remained. By the way, I think this is where lament comes into play. Remember, we, we did that study. Like, we, we take our grief and our complaints to God. I don't, Moses, this is not necessarily a lament. I think he falls short of a lament because nowhere in his prayer does he actually turn to the truth of who God is, and, and nowhere does he find encouragement in that truth. Like, he's just, I'm done. I'm out. Folks, in the midst of our disappointment, what we need is to turn to the Lord. In him, all fear is removed, for there is no fear in love. We turn to the Lord, for he alone can rescue from slavery and set you free to serve him as his own son. And we turn to the Lord because he is God over your disappointments and he has crafted them for his glory and for your good. Number two, know your Bible. Know your Bible. By this I mean read it and understand it as God has written it and not as if it were simply meant to agree with you. Because here's the thing. Most people, I think when they come to the Scripture, they have a preconceived notion in their mind about what they want God to be and the kind of God they can and cannot believe in. And so we read into the Scripture our own ideas about what God should be like. And by the way, when you do that, you're going to come up with a really thin God who is incapable really of handling your disappointments in any way that is satisfactory. Because if you find yourself in a trial or in hardship and your God is too thin for that, it, you're going to find that it's either because you messed up and God is getting you for it, or Satan's attacking you, or God is incapable of handling everything at once. Now look, I, I agree, God disciplines us, and that's a good thing. And I agree that Satan can attack, right? Look at Job. However, I will say, I think we give Satan way too much credit. I think we think Satan is omnipresent. We like to blame him for all of our wrong choices and all of our disappointments. And, man, you know, can I just, can I just say that often, even with Job, who was behind the disappointments of Job's life? Wasn't it God who set up a meeting with Satan and wasn't it God who brought Job into the picture and provoked Satan? Wasn't it then the sovereignty of God to lead Job into such suffering? You can't just blame that on Satan, folks. It was God who ordained it. And by the way, when you sin, stop blaming it on Satan. Because I would bet 9.8 times out of 10, that's a biblical number, look it up. <laughs> when you sin, it's coming out of your own heart. By the way, I would say 10 times out of 10 because you know James chapter 1, verse 13 tells us that you never blame God for your temptation, but every man sins when he's drawn away by our own desires. And those desires aren't always evil, wicked, awful desires. Like the desire to work is good. The desire to eat is good. The desire for sex is good. But God puts boundaries on all of those things. But when we are drawn away by those desires, we give ourselves to them, we serve them as if they are our master, then we become slaves 
to those desires and we sin in them. We are serving the wrong master. Folks, there is not room in the modern mind of man for a God who could or would use such devastating disappointment in the lives of his people. But that is exactly who God is telling us that he is, and he's telling us he is shouting it to us through the Exodus. By the way, you can ask the question, like, why? Why why would he do such a thing? Let me give you just two, two thoughts here. Number one, I want to quote Calvin again on this one. Calvin says, he wished to accustom his servants in all ages to patience, lest they should faint in their minds if he does not immediately answer their prayers and at every moment relieve them from their distresses. In other words, part of the reason that God allows and even brings disappointment into our lives is to strengthen our faith in the reason that it works is because our faith needs to learn to look to the Lord even when we are receiving nothing from him but hardship and trial and disappointment. It kind of begs the question, doesn't it? What do you want? Do you want the gifts? Do you want the good times? Do you want the ease? Or do you want the giver of the gifts? Folks, hardship and disappointment sharpens our focus on the Lord. And in the process, it strengthens our faith to be able to handle whatever comes our way in this life. Though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Job only could say that after everything had been taken away. Hardship sharpens and strengthens our faith. Number three, trust Christ. Folks, he is the author and the finisher of our exodus. A better exodus than that that Israel would eventually experience. It is an exodus from slavery to sin by his perfect life, death on a cross, and resurrection from the dead. He has secured freedom and sonship for all who will turn in repentance of their sin, which means turning away from your taskmaster, from your slave master, and turning to the Lord. Not turning back to Pharaoh, but turning to the Lord. Repent and put your trust in the Savior, the Rescuer, the one who will lead you from bondage into freedom. Let's pray. Father, we are in some ways amazed by your word. We are amazed at who you are. We stand in awe of you. Lord, it may be that in some hearts this morning we are not only amazed but appalled by the idea that you would ordain such hardship for your people, that you would bring such difficulties, such bad things to good people. But God, such thinking reveals a a knowledge of a God who is far too thin, far too short, far too weak to be of any real value. So God, increase our understanding of who you are. Help us to know you more. Give us grace to turn to you when the disappointments of life come. Because you are God of those disappointments. Lord, for those who don't know you as their Savior, I pray that even today they might find their rest in you. They might experience freedom through the sacrifice of Christ. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.